Thank you, Gloria. Thank you for coming. I can't compete with the Arctic island, I'm afraid, but I'll do my best to keep you awake in the next few minutes. Uh, it's always a delight to be back here in Manchester, especially with uh, my friends, our friends, uh, the Mitchells, and uh, once in a while, John Danes to allow uh, Catherine and me to fill in at the pulpit uh, at Zion Episcopal Church, which we love doing, and so a lot of folks I recognize here in the audience. So thank you for coming. I'm here to talk about evangelicalism and I think the rise of the religious right, if I remember correctly. And I wanna say a little bit about evangelicalism by way of definition so we know what we're talking about. The term evangelical actually re refers to the gospels in the New Testament. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the evangelists, that is the writers of the gospels in the New Testament. So properly speaking, and the most elementary form of that term, uh, evangelical refers to anyone who is, uh, has allegiance to the gospels uh, in, the, in the New Testament. In the 17th century, pardon me, the 16th century, the term evangelical became associated with Martin Luther and the Protestant Reformation. Uh, Martin Luther's great breakthrough was to, uh, in his, his words, his rediscovery of the gospel, trying to reclaim the gospel from medieval Catholic scholasticism and emphasize the grace of God freely given to those who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as is stated in the New Testament, uh, thereby freeing uh, individuals from uh, what he understood as works righteousness. That is, you do cer certain good works in order to er uh, win your way into heaven. And um, uh, Martin Luther's reading of the, of the New Testament in particular, particularly the book of, Revel uh, of Galatians, uh, sent him in a different direction theologically and thereby triggered the Protestant Reformation in 1517. We're coming up, by the way, on the 500th anniversary, and I've just agreed to teach a course on the Reformation at Dartmouth in the fall of, uh, 15, uh, fall of, 20, uh, of 2017, 500 years later. The term evangelical in America has a little bit different valence than it does uh, in, in other parts of the world. And I think it arises from the origins of evangelicalism in America. I understand the origins as coming about with the confluence of what I call the three Ps. The first P would be the vestiges of New England Puritanism that were very, very much present here in New England. The second P is Scots-Irish Presbyterianism, particularly in the middle colonies, or we would now uh, talk about New York, New Jersey, uh, Pennsylvania, and so forth. And the third P is continental pietism, which emphasizes a warm-hearted piety. And I think it's possible to see, even today in evangelicalism, very clear remnants of each of those influences. Uh, I think from the Puritans, evangelicals have inherited a sense of introspection. Puritans, as I'm sure you know, were always writing about and, and recording their inner lives and keeping journals and, and diaries in order to kind of take their theological temperature or spiritual temp temperature at any given time, trying to figure out, are, am I on the right path? Does, does God love me? Am, am I part of the elect? And so forth. And evangelicals today, many of them do that sort of thing as well. They're always kind of looking inward, always trying to understand how they stand in the, uh, in the divine economy. I think from Scots Irish Presbyterianism, evangelicalism has inherited an interest in what I call uh, doctrinal or theological precisionism. That is, it's very important to hold the right doctrines. And if you don't hold the right doctrines, uh, as defined by one or another evangelical group, uh, very often you're on the outs. And I have to say that I witnessed this uh, myself uh, personally. I worked for a time at a, an evangelical theological seminary as, and while I was a student there as well. And uh, I can tell you that jobs are won and lost over the tiniest, most minute theological point. And if you diverge on that point, uh, you will be subject to uh, obloquy and, uh, and, and likely uh, uh, dismissal uh, unless you, you toe the line. So the importance of doctrinal precision or precisionism, I think, is inherited from the Scots-Irish Presbyterian strain of evangelicalism. And finally, the uh, emphasis on a warm-hearted, affective piety comes from continental pietism. 
in the 17th century in particular, as uh, some of you I'm sure know, there was a kind of widespread revolt against uh, scholasticism in uh, Protestant theology, but also in Catholicism and even in Judaism. So you have various movements. You have the quietest movement within Roman Catholicism that again emphasizes uh, a, a warm-hearted piety. It's not enough not good enough simply to hold certain beliefs. You have to feel it. You have to have uh, the affections as well. And that was very important. Methodism is another example of that impulse, and perhaps the best example of that impulse. Uh, also within the uh, Jewish tradition, the Hasidic movement, emphasizing the ecstatic, very uh, inward focused uh, piety. Uh, again, not merely holding certain doctrines, but having this sort of uh, uh, warm hearted uh, affect toward religion or toward the, toward the faith. And today, I think you see this with evangelicals. Uh, you've probably seen some uh, groups on, on television uh, uh, tend to be Pentecostals with their arms in the air, a uh, gesture of openness to the Holy Spirit, uh, quite affective in their piety, and that is one of the legacies, I think, of the pietistic tradition in uh, American life. What happened was in, those, uh, in, in the 1730s and 1740s, particularly here in New England, but all throughout the Atlantic colonies, they came together in an event that historians called the Great Awakening this uh, colonies-wide revival of religion and revival of piety spurred by such uh, luminaries as Jonathan Edwards and in particular George Whitfield, who was an Anglican itinerant preacher who traveled along the Atlantic seaboard preaching to great crowds, often 10,000 or more people at any given time in an era before amplification. Uh, you, and uh, he, he was very effective in part because he had been trained in the London theater. So he had a trained voice. He understood the importance of dramatic pauses as well as uh, uh, great dramatic flourishes. And he was so effective among the colonists who at that time had no the theatrical tradition here in America that contemporaries said he could bring tears to your eyes simply by saying Mesopotamia. <laughs> So what happens is that these forces come together, the, the three Ps, Puritanism, Presbyterianism, and Pietism come together in this great colonies-wide revival that historians call the Great Awakening. What happens to evangelicalism then is we move into the revolutionary period. Uh, historians have made the point, by the way, that the American Revolution might not have succeeded had it not been for the Great Awakening. That is to say that the patriots learned from evangelicals the importance of populism, commuting, communicating to mass audiences, such as the way uh, uh, George Whitfield did but also uh, generating a populist response. And had it not been for the Great Awakening, some people argue the American Revolution might not have turned out uh, the way it did and we would still be toasting the queen or whatever uh, we, we might be doing. Uh, it's one of those great counterfactual questions. Historians love to kind of go off-roading once in a while and ask themselves, what would have happened if something different from what really happened? And this is one of those questions. What happens after the American Revolution is that there is a second revival that is called, unimaginatively, the Second Great Awakening. And this takes place in the decades surrounding the turn of the 19th century. And this revival takes place in three different theaters of the new nation, right here in New England, emanating primarily from Yale. Yale College was uh, beset by a religious revival, believe it or not, uh, around uh, 1800, 1802. Uh, students began uh, uh, forsaking enlightenment and rationalism in favor of evangelical Christianity. The students at Yale had been in the habit of re referring to one another as uh, by the names of the French philosophes, so, so Voltaire and Rousseau and so forth. Uh, they were that uh, enamored of, uh, of French thinking and Enlightenment rationalism. And there's a revival of religion that brings them back into uh, the evangelical camp. And what happens is that as these uh, graduates of Yale begin to fan out across New England, they bring with them that evangelical fervor, that revivalistic fervor. I've done some uh, research in this uh, uh, recently, um, last couple of years anyway. 
uh, looking through newspapers uh, in the early part of the 19th century here in New England and reading about revivals at places like Woodstock, Vermont. I don't remember if Manchester was part of that, but Woodbury, Connecticut, uh, Woodstock, Hanover, New Hampshire, believe it or not, there was a revival in Hanover, New Hampshire. A lot of people today would not imagine that possible, but at that time there was. Uh, and uh, communities were affected by this evangelical revival, part of this larger phenomenon that, that uh, we call the Second Great Awakening. So that's one area or one theater of the Second Great Awakening. The second theater of the, the Second Great Awakening is down in Kentucky, in the Cumberland Valley of Kentucky. And this was by far the most spectacular outpouring of the Second Great Awakening, also called the Great Revival. It began in 1800 with a revival at a place called Gasper River in Kentucky, and then the following year, a man by the name of Barton Stone began or convened a revival in Cane Ridge, Kentucky, which is not far from Lexington, Kentucky. According to contemporaries, anywhere from 10 to 25,000 people showed up at that revival, uh, very much involved with uh, ecstatic religion. There were a lot of sort of uh, quite spectacular outpourings of the Holy Spirit. Uh, critics claimed that more souls were conceived than saved during these uh, revivals, but nevertheless, there was a, a great deal of interest in spiritual matters and uh, a religious awakening that took place early in the uh, the 19th century in the South. And I think I'm, you could argue, or I'd be, prepared, I'd be prepared to argue, that the South still bears the stamp of these camp meeting revivals in many ways. Uh, it's part of the culture in the South. And by the way, camp meetings are still around. If you want to go to a camp meeting sometime, let me know and I can, can direct you to uh, one of hundreds that take place here in America even, even today. The third theater of the Second Great Awakening took place in upstate New York, a place that came to be known as the Burned Over District because the fires of revival had uh, swept through that area so frequently that uh, the, the name uh, became attached to that region. This is the region that was opened for settlement by the construction of the Erie Canal, which co was completed in 1825. And shortly thereafter, there began to be huge reports about revivals in Rochester and other cities up in uh, upstate New York, uh, the, the, the burned over district. Uh, the theologian of that revival is a man by the name of Charles Grandison Finney, who was born in Warren, Connecticut, trained as a lawyer, has uh, an evangelical conversion experience himself, and then uh, decides on the spur of the moment to give up his law practice and begin uh, be, uh, and, and uh, undertake his career or his calling as an evangelist, heads out to Western New York, becomes very influential in the social reform movement, which I'll talk about here in a minute, and the later, then later goes on to become president of Oberlin College in Ohio. Uh, Ohio. Ohio, pardon me. Um, I'm from Iowa, that's why I keep... I guess I conflated the two. Uh, so Charles Grandison Finney, who I'll come back to uh, here in a minute, was by far the most influential evangelical of the 19th century. By this time, some fairly uh, common characteristics have uh, come together to help us define or understand who is an evangelical. And I use a three-part definition. If you want to find out who somebody uh, is or whether that, that person is an evangelical, uh, apply this three-part test. First of all, an evangelical is somebody who believes in the Bible as God's revelation to humanity. And this sounds fairly straightforward, and I, I suppose that in many ways it is. But evangelicals also go to the point of claiming literal interpretation of the Bible. Now, I always want to qualify that. Uh, evangelicals, like everybody else, engage in what I call selective literalism. That is, they choose to be literal about some things and not about others. But they will claim that the Bible is their guide. And in fact, that is a very Protestant notion. Uh, one of the things that Martin Luther did was assert the, the, the centrality of, of, of the Bible, what he called sola scriptura, as the authority for the believer. 
That is, not just the Bible as interpreted through the church or through the theologians or through the, the magisterium over the centuries, but the Bible itself as the source of authority. And this has sent Protestants through the century to the Bible itself, to the text itself, to try to understand what God is saying to them or what God is saying to humanity. And as you know, I'm sure, the Bible is this wonderfully complex uh, series of writings that admits of many interpretations. And so that's one of the reasons we have the splintering of Protestantism, especially in America, because everybody has a different interpretation of one or another things. And uh, so you have uh, Baptists and Methodists and Presbyterians and Episcopalians and Congregationalists and uh, not to mention all these groups. Last time I checked, by the way, there were 54 in the handbook that uh, used to be uh, issued every year, 54 denominations of Baptists in America, uh, which by any reckoning is, is far too many Baptists, of course. But, <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's an editorial comment, I guess. Uh, uh, but so uh, coming back to, to the point, uh, evangelicals believe in the Bible as God's revelation to humanity. Therefore, it should be taken seriously, even to the point of literal interpretation. Second characteristic is an evangelical who believes in the centrality of the conversion or the born again experience. The term born again comes from the third chapter of St. John in the New Testament when Nicodemus, a Jewish leader, visits Jesus by night under cover of darkness and asks Jesus, what do I need to do to enter the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus replies in the King James Version, you must be born again. Some other translations have it born from above, but the term born again comes from this third chapter of St. John. And so evangelicals will often talk about their conversion experience. Very often it's a dateable moment and they'll be able to recount the circumstances surrounding their conversions. I was converted on, I, I'm trying to pick up my wife here. Um, I was converted on September 30th, 1959 on, um, uh, I, I say this because I usually... June 17th. Okay, I'll do it, all right. Uh, June 17th, 1983 or two? 1982. Uh, June 17th, 1982, uh, I was in the hospital, uh, about to go in for surgery that could very well have changed dramatically the direction of my life if I survived that surgery. Uh, my, uh, my roommate in the hospital directed me to read the book of Psalms and I decided to give my life to Jesus. I was converted, I became born again, I was saved. Those are all roughly uh, synonymous terms for this conversion moment. So for most evangelicals, it is a, 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 a datable experience when they forsake, forsook their past and embraced uh, salvation or righteousness uh, uh, embrace life over death, uh, in fact. So that would be the second uh, criterion for uh, a, uh, an evangelical. The third is that an evangelical takes seriously the mandate from the New Testament to evangelize, that is to bring others into the fold. So uh, you would have evangelicals who are engaged in various missionary activities and so forth, but each, each, each evangelical would would affirm for himself or herself the responsibility to do this as well. Uh, my observation over the last 50 years or so, or more, uh, is that uh, evangelicals talk about doing this a great deal more than they actually do it. They tend to hire professionals to do it for them, that is missionaries, or uh, you have these large mega churches, for example, or they would have a visitation minister or an outreach minister and so forth, whose responsibility it would be to try to bring others into the faith. But nevertheless, a, an evangelical would likely affirm that she or he has an obligation under the uh, mandate of the gospel to bring others into the faith. So those would be the three criteria that I would apply for understanding evangelicals. That is the Bible, centrality of conversion experience, and finally the impulse to bring others into the faith or to evangelize. So coming back to the 19th century in the early part of the, of the, uh, uh, the early national period uh, with the Second Great Awakening, what comes out of that is not only an interest in individual conversions, but also an interest in making the world a more righteous place. And what's remarkable about the Second Great Awakening, especially as it emanates out of uh, Upper New York and the Burned Over District, is that evangelicals are involved in all sorts of social reform initiatives. 
they are working for the abolition of slavery because they believe that slavery is not a fixture in a godly realm. And they aspired for America, but also for the world, that this would be the kingdom where God would reign. Uh, to put it in eschatological terms, I don't mean to be uh, uh, theological with you here, but bear with me. They believed that they were constructing the millennium here on earth. The term millennium comes from the book of Revelation at the end of the New Testament, where Jesus talks about constructing a 1,000 year reign of righteousness right here on earth. And what happened in the early part of the 19th century is that evangelicals believed that they could do that if they reformed society according to the norms of godliness. And so they looked around, they said, look, slavery is not part of a godly realm, so we need to eliminate slavery. They were very much involved in the anti-slavery movement, the abolitionist movement, and so forth, in order to try to eradicate the, the scourge of slavery. They also looked at those who were less fortunate. They were very much involved in the common school movement, what we would call public education today, because they recognized that this was a way for those on the lower rungs of society to be able to ascend to the middle class. So they were involved, uh, many of them quite directly and centrally, in the development of public schools or common schools as they were known in the 19th century. Again, out of their understanding of mission, trying to make this into a righteous kingdom. They were involved in the temperance movement. Now we think of the temperance movement today as being overweening and paternalistic and so forth. But in the early part of the 19th century, alcohol consumption was really out of control. Um, I, don't, I forget the figures, but uh, uh, Americans in the early part of the 19th century drank before meals, during meals, and after meals, three meals a day. Uh, Benjamin Franklin opined that if God had not intended man to drink wine, he would not have given him an elbow capable of raising a <laughs> wine glass. Uh, Americans in the early republic thought that water was good for navigation and little else. So there was a lot of alcohol consumption and with that, of course, the social problems of spousal abuse, child abuse, and evangelicals recognized that problem and they sought to reform that. Another campaign in the early part of the 19th century was the campaign against dueling, particularly after Alexander Hamilton, who's now a cultural hero because of the Broadway play. Alexander Hamilton lost his life in his duel with the Vice President of the United States, Aaron Burr, and you thought that Richard Cheney was the first Vice President to shoot somebody. <laughs> Happened a long, long time ago uh, on, the, on the banks of the Hudson River in Weehawken, New Jersey. Uh, Lyman Beecher, a, a Presbyterian Congregationalist minister, pardon me, uh, said, look, this is barbaric. Uh, this is not a, a fixture of the millennial kingdom we're trying to construct here in America and here on earth. And he undertook this massive campaign to outlaw dueling, which was uh, finally successful. Evangelicals were also interested in women's rights, including voting rights, which was a radical idea in the 19th century but they understood that as part of their mission of making this world a better place, bringing about the kingdom of God here on earth. They were involved in various peace crusades. They were even critical of capitalism, imagine that. <laughs> Charles Grandison Finney, I mentioned earlier as the most influential evangelical of the 19th century, thought that a Christian businessman was an oxymoron because business, commerce necessarily elevated avarice over altruism. And he thought that that was inconsistent with the godly society. He thought the best business model he could think of was uh, the Bible societies that were quite popular in the early part of the 19th century. So he was a, critique, a critic of, of capitalism. I even saw uh, one instances, instant, uh, in, instance of evangelicals advocating gun control in the antebellum period. So I'll leave, let you do with that, well, what you want to do with that, so nevertheless. So evangelicals uh, in the 19th century were very much concerned about making this world a better place. What I find remarkable about their agenda is that it was almost invariably directed toward those on the margins of society, those that Jesus called the least of these, people of color, immigrants, but also women, uh, seeking equal rights for women. What happens to evangelicalism over the course of the 19th century is, of course, you have the Civil War, 
And after the Civil War, evangelicals are initially involved, as are other norther northerners, in trying to help the freedmen in the South, those who've been manumitted from slavery. Uh, eventually, evangelicals lost interest in that, as did other northerners, uh, particularly after the end of uh, Reconstruction. And so the, you have a, 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 a bit of a, a retrenchment in terms of social activism on the part of evangelicals. Nevertheless, you still had people like William Jen Jennings Bryan, who was a populist, three-time Democratic nominee for president, a very important uh, figure who uh, advocated, for example, the rights of workers to organize and who criticized pred predatory capitalists in the late 19th and early part of the 20th century in addition to advocating for women's rights. What happens then, I think, is fascinating. What happens then is that in the early part of the, of the 20th century, evangelicals, many of them, feel more and more alienated from what's going on in the larger society. Uh, and this is rather complicated. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this. Uh, but uh, they're, under, they're unhappy with certain intellectual currents in American life. One of them is Darwinism, as you might imagine. Uh, Darwin's Origin of Species was published here in America on November 26, 1859. 2,500 copies were issued. They were all sold the same day, which was uh, counted as a bestseller at that time uh, for, uh, uh, in, in American life. And I think the effect of Darwin's ideas probably were blunted by the onset of the Civil War. So it's only really in the decades surrounding the turn of the 20th century that evangelicals in particular begin to come to terms with Darwin and his ideas. And it's not hard for you to understand that those who want to take the Bible, book of, uh, the, the book of Genesis, but the Bible generally, uh, literally understood that Darwin's ideas represented, at least on the face of it, a threat to those interpretations. And so many evangelicals felt back, fought back against Darwinism. They also felt uh, alienated by the acceptance of Darwinism in the larger culture. The other intellectual current that was important to them is a, a, a movement emanating from Germany called Higher Criticism that took a look at the biblical writings and sought to understand who was the author and, 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 and offered some rather critical perspectives on this. For example, in, in, in the first five books of the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament, what Jews call the Torah, uh, also called the Pentateuch, uh, these, uh, these are written by who, according to the text? Who wrote the, the Torah? Who? Oh? God. God? Well, okay, well, I, yeah, okay. <laughs> Moses, right? Moses? Right? Okay. <laughs> well, um, the, the, yeah, the commandments, but, uh, but uh, the, the, the text itself claims mosaic authorship. Well, uh, what happens at the end of the book of Deuteronomy, the end of those five books? Anyone remember? Sorry? He dies. he dies. So Moses records his own death, right? <laughs> Neat trick. How do you do that, right? <laughs> well, these textual critics begin looking through the text, and they discern that there are not, there's not a single unitary text for each of these five books, but instead there are different authors. There's a, there's a I forget all this, there, there's um, one, uh, one author who, who uses the name Yahweh to refer to God, another author, author who uses the word Elohim to refer to God, uh, there's a priestly document, and then there's a redaction of these different, uh, different uh, documents. Well, uh, this has come to be accepted uh, almost entirely by biblical scholars. But at the time, again, evangelicals saying, look, Moses said he, ought, he wrote these uh, books. We should take him at his word. And this represented a threat to them. The same thing with uh, Isaiah. Scholars now believe that there are three or even four Isaiahs rather than one single book based on various literary analyses and so forth. So this was another attack that evangelicals felt uh, from the intellectual community. And all of this came down to a week, or 10 days actually, in Dayton, Tennessee in July of 1925, the infamous Scopes trial that pitted John T. Scopes, a, a local teacher at the, in the Dayton High School, who actually couldn't remember if he'd taught evol evolution in the public school, but nevertheless, he agreed to stand trial for having done so. Defended, or represented by Clarence Darrow, one of the most famous attorneys at the time, 
And the state in prosecuting John T. Scopes was assisted by none other than William Jennings Bryan. And I think you probably all know what happened. Uh, William Jennings Bryan uh, did not comport himself very well in the course of the trial. Uh, in fact, uh, even though he won the, the case, that is, John S Thomas Scopes was convicted of violating the Butler Act, which forbade the teaching of evolution in the public schools. Uh, evangelicals lost more broadly in the larger courtroom of public opinion. They were humiliated, ridiculed, and so forth for being backwards and anti-science and so forth. And William Jennings Bryan died there in Dayton five days later, and uh, his reputation really was sealed by his uh, inept performance in the Scopes trial of 1925. The larger effect of the Scopes trial was that evangelicals began to retreat from the broader society. They began to look on American culture as hostile toward them and toward their interests, particularly toward their faith. And so in the middle decades of the 20th century, evangelicals retreat into what I call the evangelical subculture which is this vast and interlocking network of Bible camps, Bible institutes, colleges, seminaries, congregations, uh, um, um, uh, by, um, uh, missionary societies, uh, publishing houses, that were really a defensive posture against the larger world that they came to see more and more as both corrupt and corrupting. So, impermeable was this subculture in the middle decades of the 20th century that it was possible for a child to grow up within that world and have very, very little commerce with anyone outside of that evangelical subculture. And I say this uh, from personal experience. This is my own experience growing up within this world, having very, very little to do with anyone who was outside of that world or outside of that subculture. So this is what characterized uh, evangelicals in the middle decades of the 20th century. They were not politically active. Many refused to vote uh, or even register to vote because they thought that this would be engaging in uh, the devil's work, that uh, the larger world was so corrupt that uh, they didn't want any part of it. Uh, the other thing that plays into that, and I don't want to spend too much time on this, but the other thing that plays into that is that many of them effect, uh, expected Jesus to come back at any time to kind of take them out of this mess and initiate this uh, godly kingdom that I talked about earlier, although there's a different twist on this, and I'm not going to get into it right now, but I'm happy to do it in the uh, question and answer period if, if you want me to do this. So what happens in, from roughly 1925 to 1975, or at least the early 1970s, is that evangelicals are not engaged politically. Uh, and again, I remember this very, very clearly. Uh, my parents did vote, I, uh, at least most of the time they did. But they did so with a sense of, of, of resignation and, 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 and uh, almost uh, a defeatism. Well, you know, we have to do our civic duty, but you know, this is just not, not going to be productive. Nothing good is going to come out of this. And, you know, it's easy to be cynical about politics. And I think we're at a cynical moment right now in American politics. So a, a lot of people can understand that sentiment. But that was the sentiment that most evangelicals felt toward the political realm for the middle decades of the 20th century. What happens? Well, what happens is that in the early part of the 1970s, there's a remarkable movement. It's a small movement within evangelicalism, but it's a remarkable movement nevertheless of progressive evangelicals who say, we want to recover both the teachings of Jesus, who told us to be peacemakers, remember this is during the Vietnam War, right? Who calls us to racial reconciliation, but who also calls on us to care for those who Jesus described as the least of these. And there's a meeting of this group, it's a small group, 55 people, in Chicago, Illinois, at the, at the Wabash Avenue YMCA in November of 1973, and they draft this remarkable document called the Chicago Declaration of Evangelical Social Concern. And I invite you to look at it for yourself. It's on the internet. You can read it for yourself. Make sure you look at the 1973 version because that's the, the important version that uh, is drafted in this, in this gathering. And it's a remarkable statement of evangelical social responsibility that echoes the concerns not only of the New Testament, but also the 
activity and the, the agenda of 19th century evangelicals. For example, they called for racial reconciliation. They decried the fact that in a, such an affluent society, we have people who are still hungry. They decried the growing gap between the lower classes and the most affluent. They decried the militarism that, but that was characteristic of American society. Again, this is during the Vietnam War, so this is very much on the minds of many Americans. And this is one of the things they talked about as well. And also they affirmed the, the principle of equality for women. It's a remarkable document. And again, I, I encourage you to read it uh, for yourself. And what's remarkable about it, I think, is the extent to which it echoes the concerns and the passions of 19th century evangelicalism. What happens then is that two years later, well, let me go back a little bit, you know, only six months later, uh, the governor of Georgia is invited to a, an event in Athens, Georgia at the University of Georgia Law School, an event called Law Day in May of 1974. And uh, Law Day is a big tradition at the University of Georgia Law School. The, the, the graduating class always invites uh, big name luminaries, uh, very often Supreme Court justices or attorneys general or uh, US senators. In fact, the keynote speaker for that Law Day was the senator from Massachusetts, Edward M. Kennedy. And the governor of Georgia was the undercard speaker, Jimmy Carter. He comes to the podium and he delivers what uh, many people believe was the best speech he ever delivered in his entire life, where he talks about his understanding of justice. And again, what's remarkable is how closely that followed the Chicago Declaration of Evangelical Social Concern. Jimmy Carter said that his understanding of justice derived from two theologians. One of them was Reinhold Niebuhr, who famously said that the sad duty of politics was to establish justice in a sinful world. The second theologian he cited was the venerable theologian Bob Dylan, especially his song, Ain't Gonna Work on Maggie's Farm No More, about the plight of tenant farmers. And Carter cited that as another example of how he understood justice and his duties as a politician, at that time the governor of Georgia, to establish justice throughout the, his state uh, of, of Georgia. He talked about the, the uh, correctional system in Georgia, how it was overwhelmingly populated by people of uh, little means, poor people, but also people of color, and what he was trying to do as governor to redress that situation. And then he goes on to talk about the corruptions in Washington. This is the time during the Watergate scandal, of course, in 1974. But he also talked about the corruptions of how regulatory agencies very often are populated with representatives of the very various companies and corporations they are supposed to regulate. And he said, that is wrong, that is moral. In the course of his remarks, he noticed that one of the journalists in attendance had uh, skipped out for a few minutes. And initially he thought that Hunter S. Thompson of Rolling Stone magazine had gone to his car simply to refresh whatever adult beverage he was consuming that day. But it turned out he went to his car to retrieve his tape recorder to record something remarkable, as he later said, a politician willing to tell the truth willing to talk about matters of justice, even to vested interests. And Jimmy Carter then launches, uh, later that same year, his campaign for the presidency. My point bringing that all up is to say that many evangelicals, uh, progressive evangelicals, but evangelicals more generally, relished the opportunity in 1976 to vote for one of their own, an evangelical, Jimmy Carter, who was, of course was a Southern Baptist Sunday school teacher. So we have Jimmy Carter in the White House, an evangelical, after a long period when evangelicals are not involved in politics, not in any organized way. And then what happens? Now the story gets really interesting. In the course of four years, those same evangelicals who helped put Jimmy Carter in the White House turn dramatically, even rapidly against him when he runs for re-election in 1980. What happened? Well, the standard narrative is that the religious right mobilized as a political movement in direct response to the Roe v. Wade decision of January 22, 1973. 
That is, evangelicals were so morally outraged by the Roe decision that they decided against half a century of political inaction to mobilize in order to redress this terrible moral wrong. Many of them even invoked the title of abolitionists, trying to compare their efforts to abolish abortion to the efforts of antebellum evangelicals to abolish the scourge of slavery. It's a great story. It's very dramatic. It's also utter fiction. Abortion had nothing to do with the rise of the religious right. What happened? The real catalyst for the rise of the religious right, and I don't want to get too technical here in the interest of time, but I want to tell the story, was a court decision, but it wasn't Roe v. Wade in 1973. It was a court decision that was handed down in the district court for the District of Columbia on June 30th, 1971, in a case called Green v. Connolly. The background to Green v. Connolly, very quickly, and I, I don't have time to go into all the details, is that as schools began to desegregate in the South after the Supreme Court's ruling in the Brown v. Board of Education decision of 1954, by the way, today is the anniversary of that decision. It was handed down on May 17th, 1954, so uh, this is a, an anniversary. As these school districts began desegrega desegregating, of course, white parents pulled out their students and sent them to, what was the term? Segregation academies, right? Segregation academies, many of them church-related, sadly. Okay. In Holmes County, Mississippi, in the first year of desegregation, the number of white students decreased from, I, I'm not sure I'm gonna get the name, n numbers precisely right, but it's, it's, this is generally the, uh, the case. The number of white students in the public schools in Holmes County, Mississippi, the first year of desegregation, dropped from 746 to 28. The second year of desegregation in Holmes County, the number of white students in the Holmes County public schools dropped to zero. At the same time, three of these segregation academies applied to the IRS for tax-exempt status. And a group of parents in Holmes County, Mississippi, filed suit seeking to deny them tax-exempt status. And this case gets, it gets pushed in with another case and so forth. Anyway, it comes up to the district court in, uh, in uh, District of Columbia in a case called Green v. Connolly. And on June 30th, 1971, the court says, in effect, that any institution that engages in racial segregation is not, by definition, a charitable institution. Therefore, it has no claims on tax-exempt status. Similarly, any contributions on the part of individuals to such a school no longer would be tax-deductible. This is what gets the religious right started. Nothing to do with abortion. And by the way, I think my, the article that is on the back table there includes several quotes from Individuals who were there at the beginning, including Paul Weyrich, who is really the architect of the religious right, Grover Norquist, uh, Richard Vigory, one of the new right leaders, uh, also uh, Ed Dobson, who was one of uh, uh, Jerry Falwell's assistants in Moral Majority. All of them are, are, are uh, utterly uh, um, uncompromising in saying that abortion had nothing to do with it. It was the school issue. What happens then is the IRS begins sending questionnaires out to these schools, including, believe it or not, Lynchburg Christian Academy, Jerry Falwell's own segregation academy in Lynchburg, Virginia, but also a fundamentalist school in, Bob, in, in Greenville, South Carolina, Bob Jones University. And the IRS presses its case over the course of the 1970s, and finally on January 19th, 1976, the Internal Revenue Service rescinds the tax-exempt status of Bob Jones University in Greenville, South Carolina. And that is what gets these preachers going and mo organized, mobilized politically. 
nothing to do with abortion. Abortion becomes part of the, the agenda uh, in, in advance of the 1980 presidential election, but just barely. Uh, actually, I asked Paul Weyrich about this directly. I said, how did this happen? How did abortion become? Because he had made the statement in, in this gathering that I was in in Washington in 1990. And uh, I, I asked him afterwards. I said, I want to make sure I heard you correctly. He said, abortion had nothing to do with it. He said, I, I'd been trying to get evangelicals involved politically since the Goldwater campaign in 1964 because I recognized their electoral potential. As a, as a voting block. He said, I tried everything. I tried the abortion issue. I tried uh, women's rights issue. I tried pornography. I tried school prayer. Nothing got their interest until the school issue came along in the 1970s. And that is how the religious right got formed in the, the 1970s. Uh, now I'm going to segue quickly into the, into the argument that I uh, uh, made a little bit in the uh, Washington Post uh, yesterday. That is to say, that because of these origins of the religious right, I'm not terribly surprised that evangelicals are lining up behind Donald Trump in his campaign for the presidency. That is to say, when evangelicals cast their lot with the far right fringes, and I do mean that, the far right fringes of the Republican Party in the late 1970s over the issue of tax exemption for segregated schools, they also bought into a much larger agenda. And my argument is that they begin, began to lose their prophetic voice. So much so that when Ronald Reagan takes office, and evangelicals helped to elect him, obviously, in 1980, uh, Lewis Field, the pollster, argued that had it not been for the religious right in 1980, Jimmy Carter would have bested Ronald Reagan in the popular vote, at least, in the 1980 presidential election. Whether that's true or not, I guess we don't know, but nevertheless, uh, that's the claim that he made at that point. But when Ronald Reagan comes into office and he starts uh, rejigging tax codes to favor the affluent, that, that's, I mean, that's the general understanding of what he did, evangelicals raised not a, a whimper in protest to that. Uh, later on, when George W. Bush launched what Maureen Dodd calls uh, two vanity wars, <laughs> In, uh, in Afghanistan and Iraq. Again, evangelicals ignored more than a millennium of Christian thinking about what are the criteria for a just war. And many, in fact, even cheered the invasions in both of those places, despite the fact that just war criteria were not invoked by a man, a president who claimed to be uh, an evangelical. When I was writing Thy Kingdom Come in the second term of the um, uh, Bush presidency, I searched in vain for a single religious right organization that would condemn the use of torture. None of them would do that. What I argue in this, arg in this piece, and I will stop here, I'm about out of time. Uh, what I argue is that what came out of evangelicalism, given the history that I've just outlined for you, is a mutant form of evangelicalism that bears little resemblance either, I believe, to the teachings of Jesus, welcome the stranger, treat the foreigner as one of your own. Now, we live in an age of terrorism. You know, we, you know, that's not an easy thing to, to contemplate. And you know, we have, you know, there are other realities that we have to consider. But uh, one of them I don't think is a huge wall. I'm just guessing on that. But to be biblical about this, I'm just guessing. Uh, when we think about the teachings of Jesus, when we think about the example of 19th century evangelicalism, I don't see much of a connection between that and what I see in the religious right today. I believe that when historians sit down 50 years from now, 100 years from now, to write the history of the religious right, they will view it as a tragic aberration in the history of evangelicalism. One of my passions, and I'm sure that my wife <laughs> uh, would, would agree that it becomes tiresome at times, uh, is that I want evangelicals to reclaim their prophetic voice, to be the people that they, we were. I consider myself an evangelical. Uh, can, to, to reclaim the people that we were in the 19th century, the people of the book, people who took the teachings of, of, of Jesus seriously. And I simply don't see that in most political evangelical activism these days. Now, I, wanted, I do want to, to emphasize that there are some evangelicals who would, I call progressive evangelicals, who are 
sounding these themes, who are concerned about issues like police brutality uh, and, and, and racism and, and other issues in American society, but it's a minority, it's not the, the main group. The main group, as we see from the polling data and we watch their voting behavior, are falling in line behind Donald Trump. And again, as I try to argue in this article, given their origins, that should not be much of a surprise. In the decades since the rise of the religious right in the late 1970s and today, the evangelical bloc has become the most dependable constituency within the Republican Party, much the way that labor unions once were for the Democratic Party. And in so doing, I think, evangelicals have lost their soul. I believe that religion functions best on the margins of society and not in the councils of power. Once you begin to crave, lust after political power, I believe you compromise your prophetic voice and your prophetic wisdom, uh, witness. And that, I think, is the tragedy of evangelicalism over the last half century. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.